This is our second message in the series we're calling Stress Fracture. And what I said last week, and I'll say again, this is a series that's sort of dealing with God's methodology for pain management, interior pain management. We, uh, we think of the word stress, you know, as that feeling that you just can't take anymore, you're going to explode or come unglued. But there are a lot of other uncomfortable inner conditions that cause the sense of stress, and sometimes they go unrecognized. And so we're going to deal with several of these. Last week, you might recall, the pressure valve to release stress was to learn how to grieve in a good way. God meant for us to grieve, but it needs to be good grief. And when we do, it relieves that pressure valve to some measure. We said also last week, and I want to say this week and each week, that this is a series that deals with sort of a, a, a paradox. And it comes from John 16, chapter, uh, chapter 16, verse 33. And if you look at the screens, that should appear. Uh, Jesus said these words his very last night that he was with his disciples. In just hours, he would be arrested and taken to the cross. Fully aware that that's what was coming, he said to his disciples, I've told you these things so that in me you may have what? Peace. Interior ease. Interior peace. Ease. In me you may have peace. In this world you will have what? Trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Jesus is saying that circumstantially, if we're going to be sane and adjust our expectations are right, we have to expect trouble. We, we shouldn't go through life as God's people being shocked, surprised when we have circumstantial trouble. But Jesus said at the same time that we are having circumstantial trouble, which is just the norm for this age where there is sin, sorrow, sickness, pain, and death interior on the inside in Christ we can have peace or inner ease and, and so that's what this series is about it, it is about learning God's methodology for pain management learning how to have God's ease inner ease or peace uh, in the midst of circumstances that would be less than desirable for us if we could have our way now I said in the first service, and I want to say in this one as well, one of the things that concerns me when I do a series of messages like this is um, it's almost inevitable. You know, someone is going to look at this as, uh, you know, just as a coping method. You know, it's like, okay, you know, I've, I've tried this, and I've tried that, and so, okay, you know, may, maybe this will work to get rid of the stress. I'm just so sick of feeling stressed out and overwhelmed uh, and uncomfortable. I, I'll try this, and often we try to use God to get what we want out of life. We, try, we, we see even when Jesus was on earth, a lot of people just try to use him to get his miracles and things like that. We try to use God to get our agenda worked out in life. And if that is consciously or unconsciously your approach to this series of messages, that you're just looking for the, the new nifty, neat technique to bring some interior comfort, then you will absolutely miss the essence of this series. And... It will literally be a backfire. It will be impossible for you to have the kind of ease, inner ease or peace that Christ wants because we are beings that were made by Christ and for Christ. And normal human life is a life that is intimately, constantly connected uh, to Christ, lived in Christ, lived by Christ, lived for Christ and through Christ. And so if you're coming seeking a technique and seeking some relief, you're not going to get it. Seek God for himself, and the byproduct is the very ease, the very inner peace that Jesus talked about. So I, I want to clarify that because I, I don't want anybody thinking that, you know, okay, you're just going to get some new nifty technique. Now, this week, the relief valve uh, for the uh, stress is speaking it out, taking the things that are going on inside of us, identifying them, and then verbalizing them back to God, and back to God before we verbalize them to um, a human being. I mean, there's a place and a time for verbalizing things to human beings, but there is a time when we should, let me rephrase it, there is always the, the case where we should first take those feelings to God. And so this, this message is about speaking it out to release that pressure valve. Uh, th this week it appears that, you know, the BP people have finally successfully, you know, closed that down. But they were concerned initially with the valve that there could be too much pressure and it could erupt again. But they seem to be feeling safe about it. And so this is a, a pressure relief valve speaking it out to God. 
there's a psalm that I'd like to start us with. It's uh, on your program. It'll be on the screens. It's just a few verses from Psalm 62. The psalmist says, Find rest, O my soul, in where? The last word there, alone. Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. That's saying that we are not necessarily going to find rest in circumstances. We are not necessarily going to find rest in people. We find our rest in our nature, our home element, which is God, God alone. Just as a fish was made for water, we are made for intimacy with God. And that's how we're designed. The Bible is not a book trying to perpetrate a religion. It it is the designer and the creator saying, this is who I am. This is who you are. This is how I've made you. This is how life works. It's the only way life can work because this is how you're built and designed. And we are built and designed for, for intimacy, ongoing intimacy with God. So he says, find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope, my hope comes from here. Listen, human beings can't solve the problems we have on this planet. We, we can't. Our hope, our real hope, it comes from God alone. Then he goes on to say this in verse 8. He says, trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our, and what is the word? Refuge. A refuge is a place of safety. It's a safe place. It's the place where you can be and you don't have to be concerned at all about anything uncomfortable, anything threatening. It's your safe place. It says that God himself, not what he does for us, himself, when we are engaged with him appropriately, he becomes this safe place for us. But the verse before, or the phrase before said, it happens as we pour out our hearts to God. And that's what this message is essentially about. It's learning how to pour out our hearts to God as a normative uh, way of living our lives. Speaking out our inner dis-ease so that God's ease or peace can replace our dis-ease or our inner discomfort. Well, let's go ahead and look a little more deeply at this. Um, If you... uh, if you don't mind, we're going to turn our attention to um, a movie that's one of my favorites. Uh, you may hate it, and it's okay. It's not theologically accurate. I don't want you to think, oh, gee, get, get this movie. It's a great Christian movie or anything like that. But um, it, it is a movie that was extraordinary to me. The, the role was played by Robert Duvall. He should have won the Academy Award for it, the Oscar. He was actually nominated but didn't get it. But it's a movie called The Apostle. And I'm just curious if anyone in here has seen it. Can I see your hands? Uh, if you haven't and you want to see a really remarkable movie, Now, again, I'm not saying it's a great Christian film that's going to teach you how to follow Christ. But if you want to see a remarkable movie and an extraordinary performance, go ahead and rent it, The Apostle. But I want to show you a scene from The Apostle because I think that Robert Duvall in this movie illustrates in a very easy-to-grasp way what the Scripture means by pouring out our hearts to God, speaking out what is within to God in a normal, raw, unedited fashion. So I'll, I'll let Robert Duvall take it from here. Awesome. What's going on here? Whose funeral are we about to attend to here? Don't tell me it's the mine. Hmm? I'll open my mouth again, guys. Well, open your mouth and just kind of get to it. That's the best way I know. Seems that Sister Jessie don't want you among us anymore. and she, She's going to take the church away from you through proper channels. That's why we're here. We're sorry. It's just such a shock. I don't know what else to say. Uh, I just don't know what else to say. You delivered your message, and I have a seat. Thank you very much. Somebody, I say, somebody has taken my wife. They stole my church. That's a temple I built for you. And I'm going to yell at you because I'm mad at you. I can't. Take it. Give me a sign or something. Blow this pain out of me. Give it to me tonight, Lord God, Jehovah. If you won't give me back my wife, give me peace. Give it to me, give it to me, give it to me, give me peace. Give me peace. I don't know who's been fooling with me. You are the devil. I don't know. And I won't even bring the human into this. He's just a mutt, so I'm not even going to bring him into it. But I'm confused. I'm mad. I love you, Lord. I love you, but I'm mad at you. I am mad at you. So deliver me tonight, Lord. What should I do? 
Now tell me, should I lay hands on myself? What should I do? I know I'm a sinner and I once in a while, woman, I have, but I'm your servant. Since I was a little boy, you brought me back from the dead. I'm your servant. What should I do? Tell me. I've always called you Jesus. You've always called me Sonny. What should I do, Jesus? This is Sonny talking now. my son that he's I tell you ever since he was a little bitty boy he sometimes talks to the Lord and sometimes he yells at the Lord and tonight he just happens to be yelling at him. Well, It's just a, a great illustration of um, what the scripture is talking about. Just taking our, our raw, unedited thoughts, feelings, uh, whatever is going on inside, but learning how to deliberately, intentionally share it, verbalize it back with God. Uh, our, our tendency sometimes is, you know, to, to rush off to another human being. In fact, probably all of us in here have at some point or another in life gone through a difficult time when we were at that, that gushing stage where we just wanted a human body to stand still so that we could just gush and just pour out and pour out and pour out, you know, whatever. How many have ever been at the gushing stage? You'll, you'll acknowledge that. Yes. And, uh, of course, some of you here are probably verbal processors, so you're thinking, what is gushing? Uh, because that's your way of life. See, you don't, you don't even know who I'm talking about because you are a, probably a verbal processor. Verbal processors gush always, you know. It's the way they think. It's the way they order their thoughts. They have to speak things. It's, it's kind of like they, it's a scattergun approach. They just speak, 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 and then they rearrange it, and they see what it is they were trying to figure out. But anyway, but we all gush. Unfortunately, what we usually do is we gush to other human beings because we can look in their eyes. You know, they're there. They, they're tangible. But there's some things that when we're gushing to them that we really should consider a little more deeply. First of all, even though they may care for us, even though they may want to understand us, they really are always going to be limited how much they can understand. Listen, there is never, ever going to be a human being, I don't care how much they love you, how close they are to you, there is never going to be a human being that's going to understand you completely. So get over it. And don't start charging people with guilt because they don't understand you. Of course they don't. They never will. You'll never understand me. We cannot make ourselves completely known to another human being, no matter how hard we try. But when you feel misunderstood or not understood, isn't it a little frustrating? And we just feel a little, a little extra lonely and a little extra down? Well, why not gush to God who absolutely, perfectly completely always understands us he understands everything about us he's known every second of our life he knows every bruise every scar every fear he knows it all he knows the whole real story by the way he knows what actually happened what's really going on why not go to the one that completely understands and who actually has the power to help us in a useful way sometimes people you know that we go to they'll try to help us they'll do almost anything just to shut us off sometimes or to shut us up but they, they try to help and they offer their suggestions their advice and sometimes they reinforce what they shouldn't reinforce in us and sometimes they you know condemn what they shouldn't condemn but but God actually can help he knows what's actually going on and he he can bear us uh, he, he can bear the whole thing he knows all of the imperfections, and yet he still is able to bear with us. So to take these raw, unedited thoughts and feelings to God as a normative, regular habit of life is what 
God in his word says we are wired to do. We are beings that are made when we're living normally, when we're living sanely, we are meant to be in constant communion, constant communication with God. Our society today is not living normal. The models we see in our society, for the most part, the majority of us tragically live a great deal of our lives distracted, cut off from intimate fellowship with God. And, and we tend to think that that's normal. That's not normal. We were made by God, by Christ, to have constant communion with him. That's how we become our real, truest selves. That's how we get healthy and stay healthy. That's not for super-duper religious types. That's for human types. If you're human, you're created, and you have the capacity for constant, raw, unedited dialogue with God. And that's where you're going to find your true self. That's where life is. So learning to present our words to God, and there, there's really a couple important components to this. It, it calls for transparen transparency, meaning that we don't edit anything. Whatever's going through our minds, whatever we're feeling, we actually express it to God, which initially can be a little uncomfortable, but it also calls for specificity, meaning that we, we don't just go to God and say, oh God, you know, I, I just feel crummy, you know, we have to be specific in our words, sometimes for us to, to hear the word, for us to, to, to search a little bit, well, I'm feeling crummy because this is going on, or this is not going on, and I wanted it to go on, or this happened, and I wish it hadn't happened, be specific. Nothing is dynamic until it's specific. Vague generalities really don't work out in this case. We, we have to be specific. We have to identify. We have to recognize and then present these thoughts to God. We have to tell him what is going on inside of us. We need to be, be very comfortable presenting to God our plans and our struggles and our dreams and our hopes and our fears and our problems and our hurts and our pain. We have to take our griefs and our sorrows and our sins and our failures. And we should just be comfortable with this. It is, it is possible to have ongoing dialogue with God uh, all during the day as we're doing you know, our activities. I'm, I'm not saying that you're, you're you know, not focused on what you should be doing, but there's, there's the ability that God has placed in us to be aware and to stay in dialogue to some measure with Him all during the day. And that's that's normal life. That's the way the universe in the future will be. We'll all have that, that sense of intimacy with God forever. But presenting, in this life, presenting our words, our specific words to God is a very powerful thing, and God meant it to be. Listen to Lamentations chapter 2. This was Jeremiah writing after the, uh, the Babylonians had destroyed the nation of Israel, the southern kingdom. Uh, they were in captivity, taken for 70 years. But he's looking at the destruction, and, and he says these words. He says, Arise, cry out in the night. As the watches of the night begin, pour out your heart like water in the presence of the Lord. The idea is just, just dump it all out, whatever is inside. Don't crush it down. Don't let the pressure build. Pour it out. Pour it out, unedited and raw. Pour out your hearts before the Lord. Psalm 142, the psalmist said, I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord, kind of like Robert Duval. You don't have to take your words and say them out loud. You can, from your spirit, pour out your thoughts to God, and he hears, but... I believe with all my heart some of us would find it an amazing, transforming, cleansing experience if we were literally to do what Robert Duval did. Get alone somewhere and let our mouths speak out the words of what's going on inside of us so that we hear them as God's hearing them. And if we need to shout, find a place to shout. And if we need to weep, find a place to weep. Anyway, the psalmist said, he says, I, I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice uh, to the Lord for mercy. I pour out my, what is the word? Complaint. I pour out my complaint before him. We have complaints. Before him I tell my trouble. We have trouble. Psalm 5.1. Give ear to my words. Our words is what God wants to hear. Oh, Lord, consider my sighing, the, those interior uh, conditions that just make us sigh and feel crushed and weighted. He says, listen to my cry for help. We often need help. And then he says, my king, my God, for to you I pray. Look at the personal, the personal words there. He says, it's my complaint. It's my trouble. It's my words. It's my sighing. It's my cry for help. And you're my king and my God. Intensely personal and intimate. 
God wants this. I, I, I'm going to just give you something to think about. Uh, we all do this. We, we, we all, you know, you go into your public places, your neighborhood, or your place of business, or your sports club, or whatever, and you, you meet people, there's certain people that you know kind of casually, and typically, you know, you see one another, you say, uh, hey, 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 how's it going, right? How, how many do that? You say something like that. You may not say like me, hey, man, how's it going, but you say some form of greeting. How's it going? And what we're expecting back is someone to say, oh, good, man, you know, good, and you just, you go your way, right? But what if somebody sits there and say, how's it going? I'll tell you how it's going. My entire life has been, let me tell you what happened to me from the time I was two years old up to now. Let me tell you what I'm feeling inside, right? We would be freaked out, right? We'd be like, whoa, whoa. No, we, we don't expect that. In, in fact, we would never dare do that when somebody says, this, hey, hey, how you doing, right? I hope not anyway. Um, <laughs> We only share those kind, we know this, that you, a human being, anyone, only shares those kinds of things with the people that they are the closest to. It is inappropriate to share those kinds of intimate, deep, personal things with just casual acquaintances. Those things are reserved, okay? They're reserved for the people that we trust the most, love the most, believe, love us the most, right? Right? They're the ones that we share, and, and sometimes we don't even share it with them. We, we should. you got to share it with somebody. You're going to explode like that BP thing, you know. <laughs> but sometimes we don't. We feel isolated and scared, you know, that if we ever shared, we'd maybe be rejected or, or something like that. But we have to, we have to pour this out to God because, listen, there is no one that knows us as well as he does. There's no one that loves us as much. He is absolutely unshockable. There's nothing that you and I can ever say or do that's going to surprise him or shock him. His love is unstoppable. It's unshockable. And you can deepen your love relationship with God. I can deepen my love relationship. My sense of being loved by him and my sense of love for him will increase. I promise you this. It will increase as I start to share the deepest parts of myself with him. Let me go a step further. I know this by experience. You will only feel as loved by God, or you will, you will only feel God's love. We all know he loves us, but feel his love to the degree that you and I share each and every part of ourselves. We have to open up all those little dark caverns that we've tucked away in our life, the places that are so dark and so painful, we don't ever want to revisit them. We have to open up everything. It all has to be open. To the degree that we open up ourselves to God, to that degree, and not one degree more, will we feel, will we feel His love for us. Now, He loves us entirely, but we won't feel it until we open up every single part. Look, you notice on a human part. When, when, when you do have those moments and you finally share something really personal, something really vulnerable, something really, you know, scary, you know, with somebody, and you look in their eyes and you see, man, they still believe in you, they still love you, they still accept you, um, you feel closer to them, do you not? The, the, the love intensifies, it deepens. A lot of us as Christians, we're always trying to figure out how, how do I deepen my walk with God and, you know, have more of a sense of, Loving him and all, here's where to start. Learn how to just pour out your hearts to verbalize uh, what's going on inside to God. In the book of 1 Peter in the New Testament, Peter said this, and he actually got it from a quote in the Old Testament, but he said, cast all your, and what is the word? Anxiety. Anxiety. In, in the original language, the Greek there, it's the word merimnao. It is the word for worry. Worry or anxiety, they're kind of similar. Cast all your anxiety or worry on him, meaning Christ, why? Because he cares for you. Let me tell you something that happens when we do this, when we actually take what's going on inside and we pour it out to God, our worries, our fears, our anxieties, or our anger, whatever it is, instantly, instantly in most cases, those issues that we have with feelings of insignificance and inferiority, uh, instantly they go away because in God's presence we instantly know we matter we know that and sometimes that's more important than anything else this verse says that whatever we're worried about it and we have anxiety about he cares about whatever matters to you matters to him is what he's saying and when we take 
what is going on on the inside into his presence, immediately we have this sense of significance and hope starts to grow. We know we're understood. We know we're loved. We know there's, there's somebody that can ultimately take care of the mess that actually is inside of us that we know we can't take care of. And the mess around us in our world that no human can take care of that he promises ultimately to do that too. But it happens when we do this, when we, we take our anxieties and our cares into his presence. It says this in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, and, and this is written, I want to clarify this, this is written to those that are Christians, 1 John 1, 9. It is written to those that have believed that Christ, the creator of the universe, loved us died on the cross to pay for our sins, rose from the grave, proving that all of his promises of forgiveness and everlasting life he could fulfill. It's those that have said, I'm going to put my faith in Christ, and I'm going to follow him fully for the rest of my life because I really trust him. That's what it means to be a Christian. Being a Christian doesn't mean you go through some little ceremony or you have nice sentimental feelings about Jesus and the Easter Bunny and all that kind of thing, <laughs> okay? It's the real deal. It's saying, look, man, everybody's following somebody. They're either following themselves or some other human or some ideology. I have made up my mind. I am putting my faith and trust in Christ, and I am going to follow him fully forever because he loved me enough to die on the cross for my sins. He's wise and powerful enough to create the universe. I can't find anybody better to trust and follow, so I'm going to put faith in him. So this is written, 1 John 1, 9, to real Christians, okay? So let's see what it says. It says, if, notice, if, not necessarily will we do this, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just and will, what does it say? Forgive us our sins, but he doesn't stop there. And what does it say? Purify us from all unrighteousness. We need two things. We need forgiveness, but we need purification too. Now, this is written to Christians. That, that doesn't, that, that's not right. It's a, if we could, why would a Christian ever have to confess a sin? Christians don't sin, Right? I mean, Christians, I mean, once they turn to Christ, they're perfect, aren't they? They, they never sin again, right? I'm being facetious. Obviously, obviously we know. You see, God is not shocked by our condition. We are. <laughs> we are. We, we live in denial with ourselves. We just won't own what's going on. We try to focus on just those places about ourselves, those parts of our lives that make us feel okay. And, and, and until we own the sin, until we own the corruption, until we own the, the decadence and the self-absorption and, and all the junk that's inside, until we own it, God can't cleanse it. And so we, as we're sharing things with God, we need to share our sins. Now, I want to I say something. There, there's two different ways of confessing sin, two different levels of confessing sin. There's the first level, level one, and it's better than nothing. It's a starting place. It's like, God, I did it, okay? It's better than nothing. It's like, no, I don't think it's even a sin. I see everybody else doing it, and I'm just not sure it's a sin at all. That's denial. That's nonsense. I mean, if God's word is clear about something, you know, it's sin. But there's the stage one. Oh, okay, I, I did it. It's a sin. It's okay. It's a starting place, but it's really not the level that God's Spirit can start to do dynamic uh, purification inside of us with. Let me show you level two. God, I sinned this particular sin, and I did it because I wanted to experience that, or I wanted to have that, or I wanted to do that. And, and at that moment, I didn't trust you to, to resource me enough. I didn't think you really could give me what I needed, what I wanted. And I frankly didn't care about you or your laws or your will. I didn't really care, God, about who I hurt or what I had to do to get it. All I thought about was me. I didn't care one iota about somebody else's feelings or what this might put them through. It was pure selfishness, God. It was pure lust, God. It was pure greed, God. It was pure anger, God, whatever it is. I have no excuse for myself. It's not like some isolated, apart from me thing. Oh, I just was not myself. No, I was myself. This is who I am. I am capable of incredible evil. And I am evil. There's a part of me, God, that so desperately needs your redemption, your forgiveness, your, your cleansing, that if you leave me to myself, I know what I am. And I, mean, I have no illusions about I'm a good person. I, the thing about being a good person, it's easy to be a good person, isn't it? I can always compare myself to somebody else, that I'm, I'm better than them. I mean, the world is full of some real scoundrels, right? 
I can always find somebody that's a little bit worse than me. And some of us are so full of inferiority and denial that we live our whole lives cr criticizing others. We can't get around somebody or anything without getting aside, getting apart, and then just, nee, 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 just nitpicking somebody else because we feel so lousy about ourselves. We feel so unattractive. But if we were to get into God's presence, pour out everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and own it, stop Christianizing it, you know, we would find that, first of all, God never sees us as unattractive, even when we are at our selfish, sinful, most ugly state. He doesn't see us that way. But we won't know that unless we get into his presence, and he'll forgive us, and he'll cleanse us, and that cleansing starts a restorative process, and the image of Christ starts to be formed in us. It won't be formed in any other way. Now, a word to those that are, that are the... Um, the morbid conscience, uh, over-scrupulous conscience types. Uh, I would not be serving you well if I didn't bring this up. There are some Christians that have morbid consciences, over-scrupulous consciences that are, that are endlessly introspecting, you know, endlessly analyzing themselves. They are so in pursuit of holiness and righteousness that they care more about, quote, holiness and righteousness than closeness to God. Holiness and righteousness has become an idol replacing God. They care more about their performance, their persona, than God, and they become Pharisees. They become religious legalists. They become ugly moralists. And, and so if you have that tendency to be one of those introspective types, the only, only thing it does is it builds more and more self-absorption, more and more self-indulgence, and a very ugly sort of a religious character, but not the character of Christ. Listen, <laughs> living... Uh, a morally impressive life in some ways is not very hard. It, it's an easy dance. Um, this table, for example. This table does not lie. It does not cheat. It does not steal. It will not murder. This lie doesn't, doesn't uh, lust. Okay? This, this table is pretty moral in a lot of ways. And, in fact, th this table is in church every Sunday. And, and, you know, it's taken in the word. It's, it's taken in. But frankly, interacting with the table is not likely to inspire much in me. Uh, it, it's not likely to stir something in me that makes me want to be more like Christ. It's not going to really encourage me. It, it, it's, it's not going to do... It, it, it's this neutral thing and a lot of what we feel good about as Christians sometimes is this negative neutral morality that is so far short of of enthusiastic spirit inspired living that touches people and imparts something to people and encourages and stirs them and, and blesses them and builds them it, it, it's a very different thing listen if you and I start learning this art of pouring out our hearts to God. There's three things that will absolutely happen quickly. The first is that stress will be relieved to some measure. The second one is perspective will be restored. Sometimes when we get into God's presence and we pour things out, they start to look different. We start to feel differently about them. And enthusiasm will be rekindled. And I mean this word enthusiasm in, in, in the, the biblical sense. Being inspirited or filled with God. That's what it means, the word enthusiasm from the original language. There is a God-inspired life that we are called to live as Christians. It's not living in our own energy, which is kind of like that table morality, but it is living so filled with God's Spirit, so living in the sense of His presence and His love and His goodness that we have new capacities within us, and when people engage us, they feel it, man. They know it. They know the difference between a cold, legalistic, judgmental, empty-spirited moralist and somebody that's got life spiritual life to offer how many of you you know in your hearts when you meet somebody that's got a life there's a different feel man you you know it when you feel how, how many know that experience you see, yeah and so this this inspirited living it only happens as we become very very honest with god uh very raw very open you know drop all the facades and just just be who we really are and it's then that we start to find the truth 
uh, about who God is and how he actually feels about us and how he actually sees us and so forth. And believing the wrong things about God, what he's promised to do in this age or not, what he thinks or feels about us, is potentially very damaging. Believing the wrong things is very dangerous. Um, let me give you an example. You, you guys are probably familiar with, uh, with this guy. His name is uh, Michael Crichton. He's the Jurassic Park guy. But he was about to write a book. He wanted to write a book, another book, about uh, global disasters. And so to do research, he decided, well, global disasters, uh, I need an example. So he thought, okay, I'll study Chernobyl. I mean, Chernobyl, we're talking big, man, global disaster, you know. Nuclear meltdown, uh, pr pretty big. So as he was doing his research uh, in 2005, he found some very, very interesting things. And let me, let me refresh you a bit about this, um, this nuclear reactor meltdown in the Ukraine, Chernobyl. When it first occurred, they were estimating that there would be between 15 and 30,000 people dead immediately as a result of this catastrophe. They went on to project that this thing was so horrific, so bad, the radiation would eventually kill anywhere from 500,000 to 3.5 million people as a result of this. I mean, we're talking catastrophe on a major scale. They also projected that, that, that numerous people would come down with cancer, that people would not be able to have children, and then those that would have children, the children would be deformed, and, you know, all these things that come with radiation. So there were all these projections, and, and these were things that pretty much the intellectual community believed with all their hearts. And I'm going to be frank with you. I believed that about Chernobyl, too, until I read this. Well, when Michael Crichton started digging into this, hoping to get a great example of a global disaster... He was surprised. Now, let me read you what is true. They predicted that 15 to 30,000, there'd be 15, 30,000 immediate deaths. There were 56. That's a little bit different, isn't it? Let me show you how different that is. We have about that many die each week in traffic accidents in the United States. 56 compared to 15 to 30,000 immediate. And then that projection of the eventual deaths as a result of the radiation and so forth, they said between 500,000 and maybe even 3.5 million. Well, in fact, now it's had time to play out 4,000. 4,000 after all these years. That's about as many as die in the U.S. every six weeks as a result of adverse reaction to prescription drugs. Not very catastrophic on a global scale. And, and so they were believing things, but the people there were believing things that turned out to be untrue. Now, here's what's fascinating. The UN did a study, and they said that the greatest damage of Chernobyl, once they started really looking at the st statistics, was psychological. It was not at all physical. And what they found was this. These people really believed they were doomed. Imagine living, thinking that you are now going to die soon, and if you... If you have a child, the child is going to be deformed, or you might not be able to have a child. Your life is shot, you're done, it puts you into a different frame of mind. And these people were depressed, and they became listless, they didn't pursue any kind of careers, they were living on government subsistence, and they just kept decaying and decaying and decaying. Why? Because they were believing things that weren't true. It was all in their head. Some of us in this room suffer unnecessarily because we think we're unattractive. And nobody on the planet is going to convince us differently. Because we're looking on the outside and we're not looking where God looks on the inside. In God's sight, there's not an unattractive person in this room. You will never be unattractive unless you choose to see yourself that way. But if you do choose to see yourself that way, you will suffer, and so will everybody else around you with your self-pity and self-indulgence that profits no one. You, you see, what we believe, if we don't believe that God loves us today and every day, loves us in our good seasons, loves us in our bad seasons, loves us even when we sin, does he love the sin? Of course not. A word for the fools. There's always fools in every room this size. A word for the fool. <laughs> that thinks this message is giving you a license to sin, you are a fool, my friend. And I mean it respectfully, having been a fool in my past life. But you are a fool if you think that you can sin freely. You can. <laughs> Go at it. 
But what you're not free is to choose the consequences that will inevitably come. Sin is just insanity. It's just trying to live outside of the laws of your nature. You can't do it. So if you're sitting here and you're hearing this message, oh, good, man, I can go out and sin all I want, and God still loves me and pats me on the head. You're just nuts. You're just a fool. It's okay to be a fool. Probably all of us have been a fool, but you can't stay a fool unless you want to live with a whole lot of unnecessary consequences. Okay, that was a little side issue. But when we get into God's presence without denying all the craziness that goes on inside of us, and believing that he's not shocked, he's not surprised. He knew what a mess we were. We just don't know. We just don't want to believe it. And he loves us, and he stands with us, and he'll never leave us and forsake us. And if we're willing to pour this out to him, the good, the bad, the ugly, then, then he'll, he'll not only cleanse us, but he'll bring us to that image of Christ that we were meant to. We'll, we'll know what it's like to be not alone, but always loved and always intimately at home with God. And then we'll start gradually learning how to be a little bit more at home with ourselves, and, and maybe even with some other people in time. We, we, we become a little less fearful to be real. And being real is not always real nice and tidy, but it's necessary. So the first part is presenting our words to God, and that kind of deals more or less with the, the what's going on. But the second part I want to emphasize, it, it, it's, it's the, the why. Why are we feeling doing whatever it is? Wh why do we have these feelings? What are these feelings? We're, we're going to probe a little bit differently. And I don't want to sound too mystical, but I am going to say something that's going to sound a bit mystical, I guess. As we get into God's presence in the way that I'm talking about, and we're pouring out our thoughts and, and, and we're just saying things very clearly to him, you know, in our words... What happens often as we linger is that new words come into our minds. The, the situation that we were maybe intense about, all of a sudden we start to see it slightly different, or the person, we see them slightly different, and all of a sudden our feelings that were maybe full of rage and anger or grief and loneliness, they, they, they start to change. And, and then the reaction that we had already chosen or the strategy for coping, it, all of a sudden we, we, we step back and we say, you know, I don't... I don't think that's the way to handle this. I think maybe this is the way to handle this. Something happens when we get engaged with God in this intimate fashion, this raw, unedited fashion. We receive, and I was hesitant to put this down, we, we receive words. I put with God, but I was almost ready to put words from God. But I was hesitant to do that because I didn't want you to think that any little crazy word that comes in your head is from God. Because that's not true. A lot of times it's just your and my craziness. Okay? But... When we get into God's presence in this fashion, there are words and ideas and concepts that come into our minds. And when they align with the Bible, with God's word, then we can act on those. But, but our perspective gets changed in God's presence. Our feelings, our thoughts, our strategies change. In his light, we start to see things differently, which then changes the way we feel. Let me read you some scripture, and then we'll, we'll plunge in this a bit deeper. It says in Psalm 36, 5, Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. With you is the fountain of life, and in your light we see light. It, it, it is the idea that, that, you know, our perception is like walking into a dimly lit room, but when we get into God's presence and we're opening ourselves up to Him, then the lights come on and we see things that we could have never seen before. Proverbs 20, verse uh, 27 says, The lamp of the Lord searches the spirit. This is our innermost being, the spirit of man. It searches out his inmost being. God brings light into those crevices. He, he gets into our motives and, and all kinds of things that we would not discover. Psalm 43, it says, Send forth your light and your truth. Let them guide me. God's light and his word, the Bible, the truth, will always coincide. Any light that we get in our moments of engaging with God in our minds that doesn't align with Scripture, we should never follow. First Chronicles 28, 9, the Lord said this to Solomon. He says, acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. Why, Lord? Why should we do this? For the Lord searches every, what? Heart and understands every, what? Motive behind the thoughts. You see, God doesn't always just ask, what are you doing? He says, why are you doing that? 
You see, I, I, I can do some things that might look very noble and virtuous and be very impressive to other human beings, okay? But when God looks at my heart, if he sees that why I'm doing it is purely self-indulgent, then what I'm doing is really pretty sinful. It's not really impressive at all. And it's only in God's light sometimes that we see this. Some of our noblest gestures uh, and traits, I might add, in God's presence sometimes look pretty shoddy. And they just are shams for the real deal. On the other hand, sometimes when we feel really pretty inconsequential, pretty insignificant, pretty down, pretty much like a, a, you know, a failure, we get into God's presence and we see that's not true. And some of our least recognized traits and deeds shine like gold in God's sight. We realize he knows, he saw it, it matters. Nobody else maybe sees it. Nobody else maybe will ever understand it. But he does. And it's only in God's light that we see these things. And they absolutely change us. They absolutely do. In your light, we see light. He searches our motives. Now, we can cooperate with him on this. It's one thing to say, God, I'm feeling this. I'm thinking that. I'm struggling with this. I need help with the other. But then to say, God, I'm feeling this. I, I, I'm feeling, let me give you the I'm feeling sad. But, but why? I mean, I mean we, have to be, we have to be specific as we can. God, I, I'm feeling sad, but I don't know why. Help me. Help me to see what thought, what belief, what action is triggering this. Listen, feelings are always triggered by beliefs, okay, in most cases, or expectations. And so maybe we say we're feeling sad, and then God shows, well, you're feeling sad because you expected someone to treat you a certain way or to respond to you a certain way. <laughs> And they did not. And that's why you were feeling sad and kind of negative. And then in God's light, you, you see that God never promised that person was going to respond to you that way. He never, he never promised you that. You, you were foolish in expecting that. And so you were sad for no good reason. In God's sight or light, we, we see these things and it changes us. It's powerful, but God welcomes us to ask him to search us out. We need to linger. We need to learn to linger in God's presence and ask him, what am, what's going on inside me, Lord? What, why am I feeling this way? What's behind it? What thought? What belief? What expectation? Help me to see what I will not see in and of myself. In Psalm 139, we have a, a prayer, you know, designed just for this. Uh, the psalmist says, oh, Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh, Lord. And then he says this, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Let me tell you something, folks. We are capable of being offensive and hurtful and feel perfectly okay about it. Because we can always just compare ourselves to the popular opinion and say, well, there's nothing wrong with it. And yet we may be ruthlessly hurtful to somebody else. But in God's presence... That stuff goes up like smoke. Uh, we, we see it for what it is. But it's his way of cleansing us. It's not his way of condemning us. You'll never find that in God's presence. I want to close by reminding you these three things and sharing a couple little stories with you. When we learn to pour out our hearts in this way, to speak our inside out to God, stress is relieved, okay? Perspective is restored, and enthusiasm, that, that God-inspired living, is rekindled. Now, let me give you an example of something that's kind of humorous, but shows the, the negative component or, or our capacity for the negative side of this. There's a guy named Clark Cawthorn, or Clark Cawthorn. He's a, uh, a pastor now. And he tells about a time in his life when um, he was a young guy, college student, and he was traveling uh, all over Europe in this Christian musical group, you know. So their first stop was in Sweden, and he had a roommate that was going to be with him, a guy named Colin. And so after the first concert in Stockholm, this, this host couple, uh, he says that they were probably in their early 60s, and they could not speak a word of English. They, they were Swedish people, so naturally they were sweet, because you're in Sweden, you're sweet. And, um, but they couldn't speak any English. So they were to stay at their place, you know, during, during this uh, little singing tour. So they got... They got on with this, and I'm just going to read you word for word now. He says, as we rode a tram 
for what seemed like 10 miles, Colin decided to have a little fun with the language barrier. While nodding politely in their direction with a smile, he said aloud, these nice people are probably serial killers. They nodded back smiling. (laughs) They're probably taking us to a deserted warehouse just outside of town. They smiled and nodded again. Colin and I smiled and, and nodded in return. After we arrived at their place, our host, Mom, served us tea crackers and some really stinky white cheese. Colin took a bite, smiled, nodded, and said, this is the worst cheese I've ever eaten. (laughs) Nonetheless, he rubbed his stomach as though he was truly enjoying a wonderful Swedish treat. The host, Mom, nodded and smiled, (laughs) pointing to the cheese. Colin nodded and smiled again and said, if I have to eat another bite, I'm sure I'm going to be sick. But once again, he patted his stomach, smiling contentedly. A look of understanding crossed her face as she watched Colin, and with that, she cut an extra large slice of the cheese. (laughs) Placing it lovingly on the plate next to Colin's crackers. To this day, that moment, as funny as it was, still serves as a sober reminder that words and actions can often tell different stories. We have a unique opportunity right now. some of us have, have carried a carefully manufactured facade uh, for a long, 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 long time. And we've never even been utterly raw and unedited and open even with God. And this morning, we actually have an opportunity where our spirits are sensitized and our minds are focused. Where we could change that lifestyle forever. Forever. Now, let me read you some closing words from uh, one of my favorite authors that I go to an awful lot when when I myself get kind of dry, a guy named Brennan Manning. And this book is called Posers, Fakers, and Wannabes. And uh, let me just read you something in connection with that last little incident. I I will need my specs for this. I was getting real cocky. I was able to read everything without my specs, but this, this, this one I don't trust. Brennan Manning quotes a guy named Simon Tugwell in the start. He says, Tugwell says, we hide what we know or fear, or excuse me, we hide what we know or feel ourselves to be, which we assume to be unacceptable and lovable, behind some kind of appearance which we hope will be more pleasing. We hide behind pretty faces which we put on for the benefit of the public, and in time we may even come to forget that we are hiding and think that our assumed pretty face is what we really look like. Manning now speaks up. He says, well, surprise. Whether anyone bothered to tell us this before, and whether we like it or not, God loves who we really and truly are. God calls us, as he called everyone since Adam and Eve, to come out of hiding just as we really truly are. No amount of spiritual cosmetology can make us more presentable to God. God buys us in as is condition. He goes on to say, get this if you don't get anything else. The spiritual life begins with accepting God's wholehearted love for our wounded, broken, surly, frightened, sorry selves. There's no other starting point. God who spoke into existence, God who spoke us into existence, speaks to us now. Come out of self-hatred into my love. I just want to pause before I read further. Um, I've lived long enough to know that we don't always identify it as such, but we sometimes live with a lot of self-loathing. And, um, and maybe there's somebody that just this morning, this is your day, that God is telling you, just stop. You are attractive forever so in his eyes. Anyway, Manny says, God who spoke us into, exist- into existence speaks to us now. Come out of self-hatred into my love. Come to me now, he says. Forget about yourself. Accept who I long to be for you. Who I am actually for you. Your rescuer. Endlessly loving. Forever patient. Unbearably forgiving. Stop projecting your sick feelings onto me. You are a broken flower. I will not crush you. A flickering candle. I will not extinguish you. For once and forever... Relax. Of all places you are safe, it is here with me. We started this message where the psalmist said that God 
is our refuge. He's our safe place. Listen, you can be, I can be my most imperfect, unedited self with God and know that I'm loved, I'm accepted, I'm safe. And he will do for this imperfect self of mine what only he can do. He'll start to to erase the ugliness. It's a messy process. It probably takes longer than I ever expected. And gradually, but but surely, he's, he's bringing out just a little here and a little there a really, truly Christ-like Randy. And for that, uh, <laughs> for that, I will ever be grateful. And he wants to do that for us, but he can only cleanse what we bring up and own. So will you be those that live the rest of your life in constant contact with the one who loves you more than you could ever dream and the only one who can do for us what we really need done. Speak it out. Pour it out. Let's pray. Lord, the longer that the uh, longer that we walk with you, the longer that we live in your fellowship, the more stunned we become at your just amazing, amazing goodness and love, your patience, your long-suffering. Uh, we, we so long to live in a world that only you can create where every single soul all the time is filled with health and love and goodness and where every day is a good day and where always we are in your presence. We can see you with our eyes. We can hear you with our voices. We're safe forever in the world that you will someday bring. Until then, we ask, Lord Jesus, that this, this peace that you promised, even in the midst of trouble, that we might be partakers of it, that we'll learn to, to utterly and forever pour out our rawest, truest selves to you. Give us this confidence, we ask, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen.